Hello again, let's keep going with adaptive immunity. There is a lot more to see. So here we are again at the slide about lymphocytes. It is always worth reminding ourselves we draw lymphocytes like this. We draw three lymphocytes or more, and we are careful to draw their receptors. And their receptors will be identical within one lymphocyte. And instead of three, a real lymphocyte has 100,000 and they're all the same. But then if you go to the next lymphocyte, it has 100,000 copies of a different receptor. And then this one over here has 100,000 copies of its receptor. These, as dr drawn here, these are B-cell receptors, B as in uh, Bravo cell receptors. Uh, T-cell receptors we would draw differently. B-cell receptors are actually a type of immunoglobulin or a type of antibody, but they... Um, that's not that important a thing to remember. That's just why we draw them this way. You could think of them as a little mini antibody that acts as a receptor. Um, and it's the same thing with T cells. They have a huge number of lymphocyte receptors. And remember, these are randomly generated when the lymphocyte is very young. It shuffles DNA, randomly generates a new receptor. We don't know what this will detect. It's entirely possible that it will detect a protein that doesn't exist anywhere. If that's the case, then this lymphocyte will never be activated, and that's okay. What it means is that we have this huge pool of lymphocytes, and no matter what gets into our bodies, we have lymphocytes that can recognize it, and that's awesome. So, um, adaptive immunity uses lymphocytes, and you really should know what lymphocytes are. So here is a list of the major adaptive immune cells, um, including a few others. It's a very good idea for you to, in your notes, make a page for each type of cell. And you can just add things about each type of cell, because you really need to know what all of these are. And while you're at it, you could add the cells of the innate immune system. And one cell you're going to notice goes in both lists. Dendritic cells are innate cells, but their only job is to communicate with the adaptive immune system. So they kind of go in between. They are the bridge between the innate system and the adaptive system. Sorry about abruptly making that disappear, but we need to take a little detour. What I need to show you is, well, two different lists. One is what happens when a lymphocyte has been activated. So I, we, we haven't talked about this yet, but um, you have this giant pool of different lymphocytes and once you have an infection in your body and you need to fight it off, a big thing is finding the right lymphocyte and activating it. So what happens once a lymphocyte has been activated? Well, first, it goes through clonal expansion. So this is clonal, like clone, expansion. And that means dividing many times making many daughter cells. That's its job. So once it's been activated, it goes through clonal expansion, and that just means dividing many times, making lots of daughter cells, so that it goes from being one lymphocyte to being a lot of lymphocytes. That's the first thing it does. And then its daughters, its daughters, granddaughters, all of the cells that result from clonal expansion go through differentiation they go through differentiation right now what does that mean well it means they get their final identity and there are two possible identities they get two possible things one of the daughters can be one is an effector cell 
Effector cells are the cells that have jobs in the immune system or the adaptive immune system. They are the cells that are going to run around doing something to protect you. So a lot of um, the daughter cells resulting in clonal expansion become effector cells. That's critical. The, the others become memory cells. Their job is to go to the lymphoid tissue and wait. Um, they're waiting for the next time far in the future that the same pathogen or the same bacterium or virus or whatever comes back into the body. They will be ready to activate then, and they will go through the same process. They will act like the initial lymphocyte that got activated. But the difference is, instead of one lymphocyte getting activated, what the body has the second time is many memory cells. So the activation is going to be a lot faster the second time and a lot more powerful the second time. So um, this is what I wanted to show you. When a lymphocyte gets activated, it goes through clonal expansion, and then its daughters go through differentiation to become effector cells or memory cells. Okay, And... With that, I think we can go back to the slide. So this is the list of um, adaptive immune system cells. And the cells over here are the effector cells. That's it. These are the effector cells. There are four different effector cells, basically. Um, notice the first three are types of T cells. Um, and one of them is CD8 positive, so it has the CD8 co-receptor. We haven't talked about that yet, but we will. And then the other two are CD4 positive. They have the CD4 co-receptor, which we will talk about later. And so the, the full name of this cell is a CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell, and its job is to kill abnormal host cells. So what is a host cell? Well, a host cell is your cells the ones we normally want to protect. But if they're infected by a virus or if they're cancerous, really the only thing we can do to protect ourselves is kill them. So that's what a cytotoxic T cell does. Um, and then we have two different types of helper T cells, and their job is to send signals to other cells in very specific ways. So a helper T cell type 1, which we abbreviate TH1, it tells macrophages to focus on intracellular pathogens. So it, if there are bacteria living inside a macrophage because they escaped from the phagolysosome, the macrophage can still communicate that to a T cell and a helper type 1 T cell can tell it, yeah, there's something in you, you need to kill that. And the macrophage can do it. So it's essential for these um, these protect us from intracellular pathogens by telling the macrophages that the intracellular pathogens exist. And then macrophages can do everything if they just know to do it. Um, type 2 helper T cells activate B cells. So B cell activation actually requires helper T cells. Um, and once that happens, the B cells are going to go through their their activation process and make memory B cells and effector cells. And their effector cells are plasma cells. So a plasma cell is the effector cell that came from an activated B cell. And its job is to make antibodies. So most antibodies are going to be made by plasma cells. And I just mentioned memory cells. And I mentioned before dendritic cells. Dendritic cells' job is to talk to the adaptive immune system, as we will see. There's one other kind of cell um, that we talk about sometimes that I'm just going to mention in the um, in my whiteboard here. There's one other type of cell that's not on this list, and that's an immature lymphocyte. So add this to the list um, from that slide. 
I introduced these in class. I forgot to put them on the slide. It's not super important, but for completeness, if you want this to match what I draw on the board in class, you should add um, immature uh, T cells. We also have naive T cells. Naive T cells are technically mature. So we will talk about what this is, and then activated T cells or B cells, we'll talk about what that is. We'll talk about what the immature ones are, and it'll all make more sense when we get there. But these are the cells. These are all the effector cells. Memory cells are memory cells. Oh, look, it's the slide about lymphocytes again. It's very important. So when you sit down to think about the adaptive immune system, draw this first remind yourself that we have a huge pool of these lymphocytes. Each of them can only see one thing. They can only detect one epitope. And so our immune system has to find the right one and activate it so that it can protect us. So that's a thing. So switching gears now, let's get into a little bit more of um, of some activities that the adaptive immune system does. Education is a big one. So B cells and T cells are given those names, B cell, T cell, for where they are educated or where they go through their education process. T cells are educated in the thymus and B cells were originally discovered in the bursa of Fabricius, which is a chicken organ. It's not in humans, but in us it works out they're educated in bone marrow, and bone starts with B, so that's cool. B cells will do more um, education things in the spleen, but uh, primarily bone marrow. So what does it mean to educate them? Well, once they're educated, they are mature, mature but naive, and they're able to respond to epitopes. They're able to be activated. So. Until they're activated, they are mature and naive. Okay. Um, and again, most lymphocytes never activate. They just wait forever. And that's okay. So this is education. And specifically, this is T cell education. You can think of B cells as having basically the same process. But the details are a little bit different. We start with the immature T lymphocytes. They go through a test to see whether they adequately respond to MHC, and we'll talk about what that is later, but do they adequately respond to the system that's supposed to activate them? Um, many of them either don't respond well enough or we just don't test them, and so we kill them and recycle them and new lymphocytes take their place. Of the ones that survive that, half of them um, well, they're all tested for do they respond to self-proteins. So wherever they're being educated, we display all the proteins a human cell can make as quickly as we can. And if they respond to any of those, we kill them. Because we don't want them to be able to respond to a self-protein. We don't want them to create an immune response against actin or myelin or any other human protein. We want them to create a, an immune response against invaders. So if they could do an immune response against actin or any other human protein, we kill them. And that leaves 5% of the original starting population. And they are mature because they've now gone through education, but they're naive because they have not yet been activated. So they are mature but naive T cells and they wait to see whether they will get activated. Okay, so that's education. Now we switch to activation. So these are the events that happen after activation. I just drew that out for you, but here they are in pictures. This is a B cell um, that's been activated. It goes through clonal expansion. Some of its cells become effectors. Some become memory cells. So we can skip the rest of this slide. Um, and I talked about this, and memory cells wait for secondary activation, and this slide talks about why they're 
why they're more effective and why secondary activation is so much better than um, the first activation. So primary activation looks like this. You have one lymphocyte that um, makes daughter cells. And so you get some effector function from that. Secondary activation starts with a bunch of memory cells. And so when they go through clonal expansion, they quickly make a huge number of effector cells and they quickly do a huge amount of effector function. So in this case, a B cell, its effectors are plasma cells. They make antibodies. So memory B cells make tons of plasma cells and they make tons of antibodies. So um, memory cells are just better at it than the original lymphocyte was. And they, they do other things better. Um, but that's how you could think of it is the second time you get infected with a virus, you already have a lot of memory cells. So instead of having to find the one lymphocyte, you have to find one of the huge number of memory cells. And if you find them all, you get a huge number of um, effector cells from them. And what that gives us is this difference between primary and secondary activation of an immune response. And I want you to look at these graphs. What they're showing here is the amount of antibody you would detect in blood, basically, over a period of weeks, where at time zero, that's when we get infected by the pathogen. That's when it first gets into the body. And the first time we're exposed to it, um, the initial antibody that's made is IgM. We're not going to talk about that at all. Most the antibodies I draw, any antibody I talk about is going to be IgG. So let's just look at IgG. Um, it takes up to five days for IgG to appear in the bloodstream. And in the, um, the plasma cells are going to keep making IgG for weeks. And so typically, if you have a cold, or you get influenza, or you get anything else that requires an adaptive immune response, once you get the IgG, and once you would get cytotoxic T cells, you win. It's over. Um, and you can start to feel better. But that may take five days, right? That may take a week. So this is the slow part of the adaptive immune response. You have to wait for clonal expansion and differentiation before you get um, effector function, like antibodies. But then the second time, you have all those memory cells. So as soon as you're exposed to the pathogen, those memory cells are going to very quickly get going, and you're going to start seeing antibody production right away. Not only that, but it's going to be at a much higher overall level. So the second time you're infected, you're only going to be sick for a day or two days, and you might not even notice. So that's, um, that's immune memory. And I put this in here for people who are just looking at the, the slides. But that is immune memory. The second time you get infected, your immune system is better at protecting you than it was the first time. Um, and that brings us to the last part of this, which is vaccines. But all vaccines work on the same principle. They trigger primary activation, and we make memory cells. And then when you eventually get exposed to the disease, you get secondary activation. And so we use vaccines a lot against um, diseases that severely injure some fraction of the people who get them. So with COVID, for example, about... 2% of the people who get COVID um, die from it if they have uh, medical attention. Without medical attention, it's as high as 5%. And a vaccine can help them by giving them secondary activation, where they get a whole bunch of cytotoxic T cells and a whole bunch of antibodies the first time they ever see COVID. So that's the vaccine is supposed to get primary activation out of the way and populate your body with memory cells. That's the job of a vaccine. And um, vaccines are hard to make because we can't control the immune response. We can't easily control 
which kinds of cells get activated, like which kinds of helper T cell. Do we get type 1 or type 2? We can't control that. Um, do we get more B cells or more T cells? We can't really control that, and that determines a lot of what makes an antibody good or not. Okay, so, all right, so that's enough of this video. I will see you at the next one.